Tonight, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, we look at this subject, the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. Now, we'll be looking at a specific text tonight, Matthew 5, 21 to 30, but we'll be looking at the larger context of the Sermon on the Mount as a whole. And what I mean by that is the Sermon on the Mount as a whole deals with the heart of a person. Jesus is challenging the status quo. He is challenging the conventional notions of the day that righteousness and following God is about external standards or religious activity. In fact, multiple times throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard it said, but instead I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Jesus is challenging the teachings of the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, and he is reminding the people that true and undefiled religion, in other words, a relationship with God, is not about external standards of righteousness, but inward holiness and a pursuit of Almighty God. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear that following Christ is not about what we look like on the outside, but who we are on the inside. Because many people can play a religious game and look right on the outside when the inside is far from God. But when the inside is right, the Bible says you will know them by their fruit. You see, you and I can only see outward actions, but Jesus sees right to the heart. We can see what other people do, but Jesus sees their motivation. And in the larger context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus dives in in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 30, to two specific issues. He says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Begin reading with me in Matthew 5, verse 21. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. That's the external. But Jesus says to, now now look, Jesus deals with the internal, but I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, which means you empty-headed fool, whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of fire, hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and come offer the gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you've paid the last penny. Another, verse 27, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see how the external says one thing, Jesus deals with the internal. The outward action versus the inward attitude in the heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, then the whole body be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for that one of your members perish, than the whole body be cast into hell. Remember tonight, the power is in the Word. And Father, we ask that you would take your precious, holy Word. Speak to our hearts now. Spirit of God, work in our lives. Cut us to the heart. Lay us open and bear before you, and do a work within us for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know the human heart is an absolutely amazing marvel? The human heart is spectacular. Do you realize that your heart can continue pumping even when it is severed from all of the nerves associated with it in your body? What an amazing, miraculous gift of God, the human heart. The human heart beats an average of 75 times a minute, 40 million times a year, or 2.5 billion times over a lifespan of about 70 years. At each beat, the average adult discharges about 4 ounces 
of blood. Every time your heart beats. This amounts to, now listen to this, 3,000 gallons a day or 650,000 gallons a year. Enough to fill 81 tanker trucks at 8,000 gallons each. The heart has enough strength to lift a 150-pound man three stories high. The heart has enough strength in just 12 hours to lift a 65-ton tanker truck, tanker truck off the ground. Over the course of a lifetime, if you were to harness the energy and the beating power of a heart, do you realize over the course of a lifetime, the heart would be strong enough to lift the largest battleship out of the ocean? That is, a, is an amazing miracle beating inside of your chest. What an incredible gift of God. But do you know our heart is not strong enough to follow God? Our heart's not strong enough to seek after Him. Our heart's not strong enough to be faithful. With all the power and all the ability that God has granted to us in the human body and the heart, we don't have the strength to follow Him. Joseph Stoll says this about the heart. The word heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. It is the part of our being where we desire, deliberate, and decide. It has been described as the place of consciousness and decisive spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person as a whole. His feelings, his desires, his passions, his thoughts, and his understanding and will. The heart is the center of the person. The place to which God turns. You see, your heart is more than just a muscle in your body that pumps blood. More than just the muscle that keeps you alive and pumps blood to the extremities of your body and your vital organs. The heart is who you are. When the Bible speaks of the heart, it's not talking about that muscle in your chest. It's talking about your personality. It's talking about your longings, your passions, and your desires. Your heart represents who you are. And in the end, Jesus wants you to know he's paying attention to your heart. That doesn't mean that Jesus is a cardiologist. What does it mean? It means that Jesus cares for and is concerned about what's in your heart. The Bible says that God looks at the inside when man looks at the outside. And here are two simple examples in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus gives two examples, the example of anger and the example of adultery, to prove and to show that God is more concerned with what is on the inside than what is on the outside because what is truly on the inside will always manifest itself outwardly. If you are truly a follower of Christ, desiring to serve Him, to love Him, developing the fruit of the Spirit, it will be manifest on the outside. This talks about the heart because far too many people honor Christ with their lips, but their heart is far from Him. Specifically tonight, we'll notice two truths from this text as we're in our series entitled Accidental Pharisees. We think about the subject, the heart of the matter. Number one, Pharisees would rather save face than restore a relationship. Pharisees would rather save face than restore a relationship. We see this in verses 21 to 26. The Bible tells us that Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, he destroyed the law's power over you and me. In other words, now believers in Jesus Christ are not driven to fulfill the external obligations of the law. We are driven by love. We're driven by a desire, by a compulsion. Paul says in the New Testament, the love of Christ compels me. We are driven by a desire to honor Christ. Now Jesus goes much deeper than the law. The law only deals with the externals and it can only reveal what is wrong and never correct what is right. Jesus goes even deeper than that. As he talks about anger and adultery, there are two main issues that he brings up. The first issue is the issue of forgiveness. Jesus talks here in this text about hatred and about murder. Look at what he says again in verse 21. You've heard it said to those of old you shall not murder and whoever murders shall be in danger of judgment. That's an external act. But Jesus says whoever's angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever loses his temper 
with his brother and says, Raka, you shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says you fools shall be in danger of hellfire. What is Jesus saying? He's saying there is an external act, that act of murder, that is a sin. But murder begins in the heart. And the issue of the heart is right where it starts. And Jesus goes beyond the external to the internal. In, in fact, the Bible says here that we ought to be reconciled with one another. What's the instruction of Jesus? If you read this text in verses 21 to 26, he's talking about when relationships are severed. He's talking about when problems arise in relationships and there's difficulties and when two parties can't get along. What does he say? Jesus says when you cry out to one, you, you, you've heard you shall not murder, but when you cry out in anger, when you live in a situation where you don't have peace with others, you're just as guilty as you would be of murder. That's a harsh saying. That's a serious statement. I've never had a desire to murder anybody. I've, I've, I've never done that before, and I'm sure you haven't either. You've never, you've never thought about that even, but Jesus is saying when you harbor anger and bitterness and hatred in your heart to another, it is just as bad. Jesus deals with matters of the heart. In fact, if you'll direct your attention to the screens, we'll read Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Paul gives us a clear instruction. Look at what it says. If it possible, as much as it depends upon you, live at peace, live peaceably with all men. Jesus is saying you ought to live in such a way as to restore relationships with one another. Anger is such a foolish thing because it binds you and imprisons you. Anger destroys instead of builds. Anger destroys relationships. To hate someone, the Bible says, to commit murder in your hearts. Again, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. Look at what this text says. Whoever hates his brother. Look at this now. Whoever hates his brother. Next. Is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Do you see that? Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Jesus is saying the same thing the Apostle John is saying. That those external actions are always driven by an inward feeling or motivation. Nobody goes and murders somebody without that hatred and anger and bitterness in their heart. Jesus is saying that it gets deeper than just our external activity. Yet a Pharisee would rather save face than restore a relationship. Look at what it says. A Pharisee has a hard time with forgiveness. Now I want you to notice what it says here, and this is big. Jesus says you shall not murder whoever is angry, whoever flies off the handle. You're just as guilty as a murderer. Then he says you ought to be concerned with reconciling relationships. You ought to be concerned with living in a right relationship with men and women. And here's what it says. Face your anger honestly and restore relationships with other people. Pharisees have a hard time with forgiveness. You know why? Because they think there are not many things they need to be forgiven for. Jesus is talking about forgiving one another. And a Pharisee has a hard time with forgiveness because they think they're perfect and they don't need forgiveness themselves. But the truth is, when you come to Christ recognizing your need for grace, recognizing your need to be forgiven, you are much more apt to forgive others when they've wronged you. When you recognize all that God has forgiven you for, you are much, much more desiring to forgive others. And you know what? God is in the restoration business. A Pharisee would rather save face than restore a relationship, but God is in the restoration business. God desires us to be humble. God desires us to make it right. Heard a story about an airline who had a mix-up. I know you can't imagine that ever happening. An airline had a mix-up in his schedule. Passengers waited several minutes on the plane, and there was confusion concerning the destination of the flight. The plane sat there at the gate, didn't move away from the, the gate. The crew seemed to be in deep discussion about something. They were going back and forth, back and forth. Finally, one of the flight attendants picked up the, the phone to speak to every one of the loudspeakers. As ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be some confusion about the destination of our flight. If your destination is Omaha, please remain seated. If your destination is Dallas, please depart the plane at this time. Suddenly, the door to the cockpit flew open. 
The pilot jumped out, put his coat on, his hat, grabbed his bag and said to the folks, Sorry, folks, looks like I had the wrong plane. Now can you imagine? Can you imagine being that pilot? The truth is that many of us are headed in the wrong direction. But we don't have the humility or the desire to recognize that we've made a wrong choice. Look what the Bible says here in verse 23. Now this is powerful. If you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar, go your way, be reconciled to your brother. What is Jesus saying? I notice this phrase. He doesn't say, if you have some, something against someone else. He says, if somebody has something against you. He says that when you come to worship God, and you are not right with your brother or sister in Christ, you go make that right first and then come back to worship God. You see, we can't be right with God unless we're right with our fellow men, and we can't be right with our fellow men unless we're right with God. The vertical relationship and the horizontal relationships must match. And Jesus says something very important, and you and I need to pay attention. Maybe we need to be like that pilot. The Spirit of God says you're headed in the wrong direction. We need to... We just need to to take a little piece of humble pie and admit to others, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I'm headed in the wrong direction. I'm going the wrong way, doing the wrong thing. Sometimes we need to be willing to look silly in order to make sure that we're headed the right way. But Pharisees never want to say, I'm sorry. Pharisees never want to say, I'm wrong. They would rather live with a poison of anger then humble themselves and seek to restore a relationship. So what is the condition of your heart? What is the desire of your life? You know, just this week I heard that George W. Bush had a surgical procedure. He had a stent put in because he had a blockage in his heart. Did you hear that this week? You know how he discovered he had a blockage on his heart? Just a regular checkup. Just by going to the doctor when he was supposed to go. They got in there, they got that taken care of, and now he's going to be just fine. Some of us need a spiritual checkup, a heart check. I mean, we constantly need our hearts checked. I don't know about you, but I know my heart is an idol factory, I-D-O-L, an idol factory, always seeking to put other things in place of Jesus Christ, always desiring to put other things before that primary relationship. So I need a heart check, and I need to make sure that others, my relationship with others is being reconciled consistently. Pharisees would rather save face than restore a relationship. Number two, Pharisees would rather appear righteous than deal with sin. Pharisees would rather appear righteous than deal with sin. We see this in verses 27 to 30. So if the first idea that we see is forgiveness, the second big idea that we see is repentance. Pharisees don't like to ask for forgiveness and they don't like to grant forgiveness to others. They want to hold a grudge. They want to harbor bitterness. Pharisees also don't practice repentance. Why? Because their heart is not humble before God. And if your heart is not humble before God, you will not see the need to repent. Pharisees would rather maintain an outward action, an outward appearance of righteousness than actually do business with God. In other words, Pharisees don't like going to the altar. Y'all hear that? Pharisees don't like going to the altar. They want to appear righteous. You know, these aren't just steps that come up to the stage. This is not just a stage. This is not just a way to get up here. This is an altar. In Old Testament times, you know what the altar was for, don't you? The altar was where you placed the sacrifice. This is an altar. This is a place to do business with God. And I'm telling you, I've not known one Christian that hasn't at one time or another needed to come to the altar and do business with God. 
There's nothing super spiritual or special about this place. Yes, I know people say I can do business with God right there in my seat. I get that. I understand that. But there's something powerful and profound about being willing to walk down in front of people and lay a burden here at this altar or get right with Jesus or come to Christ. There's something powerful about shedding tears right here before people, the body of Christ and Almighty God. It takes humility. That's what this is for. Pharisees don't like that. They'd rather appear righteous. They don't want you to think that there's anything going on in their life that's not just right. Can I be honest with you? You don't have it all together. Neither do I. Nobody does. We are in constant need of grace, of forgiveness and redemption, just like the air we breathe. And so for us to pretend like we're super holy, special, spiritual saints, special op Christians is absolutely ridiculous. It is pride. It is arrogance. It is not honoring to God. Pharisees don't like the altar. Notice the latter part of this text, verses 29 to 30. This sounds very extreme. What is Jesus trying to say? If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it far from you. For it's more profitable that one of your members perish than the whole body be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable that one of your members perish than the whole body be cast into hell. Now think about it. Jesus is speaking in the context of adultery, of lustful, sinful thoughts. Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. That's one of the top ten, right? It's one of his commandments. Absolutely. We believe and affirm that. But Jesus says, I say to you, whoever looks at a woman in lust has already committed adultery in his heart. We don't like to talk about that, now do we? Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter, not just the external actions of a person. And so here he goes on to say in verses 29 to 30, some hard sayings. What does Jesus mean? If your right eye offend it, offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. What is Jesus teaching? This is a hard saying, is it not? Is Jesus literally teaching that if we sin with our eyes, we ought to pluck our eyes out? Is he literally teaching that if we sin with our hands, we ought to, pluck our, we ought to cut our hands off? You see, there are some times in Scripture when Jesus speaks literally, and sometimes he speaks figuratively. Jesus said at one point, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have any part in the kingdom of God. What does he mean? He's talking about partaking in his salvation, his death upon the cross. Here, Jesus is being very clear. Think about it now. He's using hyperbole to make a point because if my right eye offends me and I pluck it out, could I not sin with my left eye as well? If my right hand offends me and I cut it off, could I not sin with my left hand as well? Jesus is making a point by way of exaggeration, by way of hyperbole, saying sin is dangerous and you ought not fool around with it. You deal with the internal motivations. He doesn't switch to the external while talking about the internal. He's saying something significant here about our hearts. In other words, if there are places you go or moments in your life when you are more tempted to lust, do away with it. Stay away from it. Cut it off. If there are moments and, and, and problems and issues that lead you into sin in other ways, rid them from your life. Sin is a seed that germinates in the soul of a human being and grows and produces a bitter, bitter fruit. And Jesus says, don't allow sin to have an opportunity to grow. Cut it off. Rid yourself of the dangers of temptation. We are so foolish. Pharisees are this way. We think we can get so close to the edge without going over. And we fall. Jesus is teaching us the terrible danger of sin. In other words, he's saying you would be better off to go without eyes or to go without a hand than to spend eternity in hell because you're separated from God by those things. But those of us who are super religious, those of us who are pretty righteous, those of us who may struggle with Phariseeism from time to time, we would rather go through life 
looking righteous than truly repenting of sin. Jesus says we're in great, great danger. You see, we ought to deal with the sin in our lives. Cut ourselves off from those things that feed our lustful thoughts or desires. Jesus is making something very clear. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, and you are absolutely right. But I say to you, lust is what causes adultery. And whoever lusts in his heart after one is just as guilty. The look that Jesus mentions here is not just some casual glance. It is a look of lust, a purpose of lusting. You know, each year thousands of tourists travel to Mount Rushmore National Memorial right there in Keystone, South Dakota. You've seen the pictures, I'm sure. Maybe you've been there yourself to Mount Rushmore. There the images of four famous presidents are etched upon the side of the mountain. What the average tourist, the average American doesn't realize is the constant work that goes into keeping those sculptures just like they're supposed to be. One week every year in September, workers labor from dusk till dawn, working on the sculptures there on the side of the mountain. In fact, from dusk till dawn, that week, they work hard. They they scale the mountain right there on the faces of the presidents. That'd be kind of scary, wouldn't it? And they pull out bird nests, shrubs, and most importantly, they fix the cracks, the fissures that have been created by weather and by other events right there on the presidents' faces. They take a special kind of concoction. It's, it's uh, a mixture of granite, dust, linseed oil, and white lead. And every crack on every face is filled in just perfectly and then sanded down. So that the presidents still look like they're supposed to look. Because you know when fall comes and it begins to rain or the snow begins to melt... The rains could freeze there in the cracks, and the face of the presidents would completely shatter. So one week every year, their only job is to deal with the problems that that has resulted over the course of a year. I don't know about you, but I need constant self-inspection. There are cracks that form in my heart and in my life. And if I'm not careful, the enemy loves to do everything he can to take that foothold and turn it into a stronghold. He does everything he can to take that crack and to to make it a wedge between me and God. He does everything he can to shatter your life by just one small sin. There is no such thing, is there? We need constant self-inspection. We need to go over our lives, constantly scour our lives, anything in there that is not honoring to God. But you know, Pharisees don't mind harboring bitterness in their heart or harboring sin as long as other people think they're righteous. But one day, they will shatter. Here's where I think we miss it so many times. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 to 26. You don't mind, just turn there with me for a moment. Matthew 23, verses 25 to 26. God does not look at our outward appearance. He looks at the heart. We'll deal with Matthew chapter 23 in a later sermon in this series, but I want to bring this up again today. Jesus is saying something very profound, very powerful to you and to me. Look at what he says. Begin reading in verse 25. Woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish. But inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Jesus brings it all together right here. Reminding us that we spend so much time making sure that we look good on the outside, but far too often we are dirty on the inside. What 
What use is a cup that's dirty on the inside? You want to drink out of a cup like that? You want to use a cup like that? But I've used cups before that are clean on the inside and dirty on the outside. Jesus is saying that Pharisees focus so much on the externals, they focus so much rather than dealing with sin, they want to look righteous. Rather than repenting, they want to look holy to others. You see, Pharisees, Pharisees really don't mind what God thinks as long as other people think they're righteous. Pharisees really don't care about the condition of their heart as long as other people think they're holy. But let's ask a question. Is it more important what you think of me or what God thinks? Is it more important what others think or what the Almighty thinks? You see, if I'm going to be right with God, I need to be concerned about these two ideas. I need to be concerned about forgiveness. I need forgiveness and I need to constantly grant forgiveness. I constantly, as Christians, we constantly need to be in a state of repentance. As you well know, Jesus says, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. It always is. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Because everything that we do and who we are comes from within us. We need to guard our hearts, direct them toward the Lord Jesus Christ, depend on His grace. I am in constant need of forgiveness and repentance. Forgiveness and repentance. Forgiveness and repentance. So are you. Don't be a Pharisee. Don't be a Pharisee. Believing that as long as everybody else thinks you're okay, you're just right. Make sure you're right with God. I'm going to ask you.